behind us, right on the side of us. You can, you can kind of see the thing moving through the woods. Uh, all I can remember is flipping the light on, and I see this creature, and I knew, I knew in my heart, I knew in my mind, in the whole night, this isn't a man. And then this thing walks across the road, takes a turn towards us, and then leaps over a guardrail. Went to look forward, and there was a big black face. Squatch DTV, exploring the Bigfoot mystery each week with your hosts, veteran researcher, author, and TV personality, the Squatch detective, Steve Culls, and from the Bigfoot Research Project of Kentucky, Chris Bennett. Sit back and buckle up as we bring you guests from around North America discussing the Bigfoot phenomena, but not without a few laughs, too. Here are your host, Steve and Chris. And good evening, cyberspace. Welcome to Squatch DTV for today's date, January 8th, 2023. I'm your host, your guy, the Squatch Detective Steve Coles, along with my co host. There he is. The What's man. going on, Mr. Steve? Good to see you, bud. Hello, Mr. Chris Bennett. How are you tonight? I am doing great. And uh, the weather has been nice and wonderful here lately. I was able to get outside a little bit yesterday. But uh, literally seconds before the show started, something got into my eye. I have no idea what it is, but uh, if, I, if I blank out here for a minute, I may have to go to the bathroom and run some water in my eye. I have not. It can't be hair. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Murphy's Law, but that's okay. We'll, we'll work through that. And as you know, folks, tonight we're joined by our guest, Dr. Tim Otterson, DVM. There he is down there. Hello, Tim. How are you tonight? Oh, just great. How are you guys? We are marvelous. Well, I'm marvelous. I don't know about old scratch well, you know, guy there. I'll Stop be able to, yeah, Stop I'll either be okay or I'll Stop come back with an it. eye patch, you know. Stop rubbing it. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can only make it worse if you rub it. Yeah, yeah, well. Can't uh, not rub it. Uh. Yeah, I was a medic at one time. Don't. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, a few things, folks. If you're first time here, welcome. I know we've we've gotten a lot of new subscribers over the last six weeks uh, oh. since we've been doing all the other stuff, the squatch stories, the the laugh tracks, and all that fun stuff. So welcome to all everybody that's new. You know, bring up a chair, make yourself at home. Good to see you guys. <laughs> And um, the other thing, too, is that we just launched uh, a website for just the YouTube channel. It's SquatchDetective.tv. And it's got, you know, if you want to see everything on the, about this channel, just go to SquatchDetective.tv. There's also a place where you can get emailed notifications about new videos as well. So if you go down there, you sign up for the notification on the videos, you'll, you'll get an email saying, hey, we, we just cut a new video. So that that's up. 
Now, this week, for those who don't know, we took a poll um, for uh, perhaps starting a a uh, behind the scenes look type of membership thing. It's by no means going to affect uh, any of the content we put up there. Squatch DTV will always be free. Some of the background stuff, it's just a way of supporting the channel. Some of the background stuff, you may see some behind the scenes stuff and maybe some outtakes and may, maybe a little special project here and there that I'm doing that's really not going to make it to the YouTube platform. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll even show you some evidence that uh, I, I don't publicly put out there as evidence, but may have some bearing. So um, we'll, we'll be uh, launching. A, a, we took a vote and it turned out to be something like uh, like 60, 40, uh, pretty much. Uh, I think it was like 61, 39 in favor of starting a membership. So we're going to throw that out there. Nobody has to subscribe. It doesn't want to. You're not going to see anything drop off here. We have too much fun doing this stuff. So. Um, We'll still have the analysis. We'll still have Squatch Stories. We'll still have the podcast. We'll still have laugh tracks. Uh, what goes on there is going to be even extra. So, And I just wanted to mention real quick that uh, if any of you guys are doing the, the streaming, uh, live streaming or something, uh, instead of like when, when you cut the cable, over on the 2B TV website, they've got a new documentary. Of, I don't know. I thought it was new, but I can't come find out. It was a couple of years ago it came out, but... They just got it on 2B TV. It's called Mountain Devil 2. Two. And it's the about search for yeah, the search for Jan Clement. Yeah. Right. And yep. uh, Steve did a whole investigation and a whole show about that. So Steve was had some major airtime on that. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. I was like, whoa, Steve, dude. But uh his findings were really, really interesting. <laughs> and, uh, yep. Yeah. I thought mean, I'd uh, mention that. It's on Tubi. It's free. For, uh, for those who don't know, there was a book called The Creature written in 1976 under a pseudonym of Jan Clement. And what this documentary covers is exactly who is Jan Clement. And it's about a the first really written account of a Bigfoot, alleged Bigfoot habituation. And um, very interesting how the story ends. Um, it's not a very thick book, but it, supposedly it was supposed to be a real thing and it was based on a lot of real geographic locations and i did a long investigation on that um yeah. and and reached out to some locals and stuff like that so uh pretty much nailed who jan clement was yes hmm. they still don't admit to that though on the the documentary but uh yeah. the evidence is right there even from uh the library of congress uh yeah. Yep, no, the one you, you found, that, yeah, that I found. Yep, that, that was good. <laughs> that yeah. that's the nail in the coffin right there. Yep, um, yep. I actually uh, found a uh, the actual person who uses the pseudonym Jan Clement, and no surprise, it was somebody related to that event. So watch the documentary. <laughs> that's right. Or go back and listen to our show on it. That's, it's I can't remember what which one that was, but uh, God, I it's, know it's in one of them. Well, this is episode 108, oh. and wow. today's episode, yeah, and to think we've taken, you know, here and there because of my job, uh, you know, the period, uh, usually yeah. uh, the, the end of summer through the beginning of fall, I'm kind of tied up. Yeah, we took job. a little time off, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to do that this year, though. This year's a little, I think it's going to be a little bit different, I think. so we'll see. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to roll out the membership thing probably another month or so. We'll see, you know, how, how things progress. But, uh, the, and, and the reason, like I said, the reason why is that we're trying to up our game a bit here and we have a lot of things in place and it costs quite a bit of money to keep some of this stuff rolling. Um, so it's just going to offset the cost of what we're spending to keep this stuff going on. Um, I certainly don't expect to be a retired retiring for, uh, because of my YouTube channel anytime in the near future. So uh, that's yes. for sure. This is a labor of love. Uh, so uh, one last I, don't, I don't look, I don't look forward to the cost of getting back in the field again, because that's going to cost a lot of pain and suffering, but uh, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be good for me. And gas. <laughs> Yep, and uh, for those who are in chat, let's remind everybody while you're here, 
smash that like button while you while you're here and while it's early on just uh, you know we appreciate it. it helps us with the algorithm smash that thumbs up leave a comment after the show what you thought and uh we're gonna be getting in with tim now and um so yep. uh, that'll help I'm, us get found it really does i mean yes, if, does. if you don't uh nobody will know we're here yep <laughs> and uh okay dr tim you're in the hot seat now excellent <laughs> so uh you know dr tim you've written this uh wonderful uh book uh all creatures weird and dangerous great great read um i just got done with the sasquatch chapter today mm-hmm. and uh you, you you really write quite elegantly and oh. uh, I, i'm enjoying it and um so why don't you set out and tell us a little bit first let's tell, talk a little bit about the book you know uh, you know your background and why you start you know why you wrote the book yeah, so, so I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, uh, and thanks, really, thanks for having me on. This is like, I, I'm so pleased to be here. I, I, want, I practically want to pinch myself. Um, the, um, cause I see how many great people you've had on this program. I, I, I've, I've spent the last, spent the weekend going back through your old shows, which I'm sure your, your, your regular viewers do. And you guys, you guys are very busy. Um, so, so I am, um, I live in Buffalo, New York. Um, and I am a veterinarian. Um, I have been practicing in the small animal practice for the last 24 years. Um, uh, and I have an interest in cryptozoology, always have. Um, and I decided it would be, int- I would write a book, about, uh, write a memoir about, you know, what it would be like to be a veterinarian for all creatures. So, and there's, there have been some really great um, um veterinary memoirs out there um you know most people know of james harriet uh and i I co-opted the name from him um and um and so i just i just went with it very cool now a lot of fans in the chat yeah you sure do yeah these are all people that these are my friends (laughs) and at least a couple of them were I've, i've obviously been promoting this locally you know, through all the awesome. media and texting and, and, you know, telling them how, about your show and all that. So I hope you get a, I hope we all get a, some nice exposure tonight. <laughs> yeah. So here's the question I have. You're, so you're a veterinarian. What in the world made you decide, you know, Hey, you know, what would it be like to, you know, uh, talk yeah. about a Sasquatch yeah. or talk about yeah. a unicorn or talk about. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, uh, it, it, it's, um, you know, it's a memoir, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to cover, you know, things that happened to me. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's veterinary, there's, there's doctors for everybody. Um, you know, your cat, your dog, we talked about your dog when I met you at the expo. I mean, people love veterinarians. They love what we do. Um, uh, and, you know, I spent a lot of time as a wildlife rehabber when I was in school, with um, with mainly birds, uh, which is just a, a fantastic experience. Um, and then I, I thought it was time to you know write something kind of outside the box, you know, to to talk about what to talk about these creatures as wildlife, um, you know. And and so it, everybody loves Bigfoot, uh, as you as you know. I mean, it's a huge topic. So um, yeah, and you know, and I, I worked in a zoo for a while. Um, one of my friends is the zoo vet. I volunteer there a little bit um, here at the Buffalo Zoo, probably not as much as I should. Um, yeah, so it's just a it's just a matter of you know taking that next step and uh, and you know making it a little bit more exotic. Nice, nice. So at, at the zoo, it was the most yeah. coolest animal you ever worked on. Yeah. So I, you know, I thought I wanted to be a wildlife vet and a, and a zoo vet when I was going through school. Um, I work in an all feline practice here in Buffalo, um, so I, I don't do that currently. But when I was a student, um, I, I worked at the Gladys Porter Zoo in Brownsville, Texas, which is a lovely little zoo there. Uh, I also worked at the Wildlife Clinic at uh, Tufts University. I did a rotation there too. Um, and man, the creatures you can see at a zoo. I, I have probably had a part in treating just about everything you can think of. Um, you know, 
one day you show up and they say, okay, it's time to get blood from the elephants, you know? Um, yeah, be careful, you know, take your, don't wear your steel toed shoes, you know, don't go on the wrong side of the bars. Um, and one day um, she's like, okay, we have to give the chemotherapy agent to the Cobra. Uh, he, she's doing really well. So, and like the next thing you know, I, I'm not making any of this up. The next thing you know, you're in with like an eight foot snake that could, you know, kill everybody in the room. Um, right. And, you know, one day we were like doing rhino transport. Um, yeah. You know, it's a fun profession. It's a fun yeah. profession. Um, I got, you know, in, as a wildlife, <clears throat> uh, as a student in wildlife, we had, um, uh, you know, bald eagles and peregrine falcons and, 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 you know, these birds get found on the side of the road and they get brought to the vet hospital and, you know, someone's got to care for them. Right. Yeah. Well, I so, think I would draw the line at snakes, uh, especially the <laughs> snakes. <laughs> Chris hates I, snakes. I, <laughs> no, and you're, you're right, Chris, because a lot of places do. They, they won't treat anything venomous. Like at the LSU, I went to LSU in Baton Rouge, Louis, Louisiana State University. Uh, I'm from Louisiana and Texas originally. Um, yeah, and they won't treat anything venomous there because they just don't want anything getting loose and, you know, killing somebody on campus. But um, one, of the, one of the odder things that happened when I was at the, the zoo in Brownsville, Texas, um, they have, um, they're on the Mexican border. So if there's any kind of seizure by, you know, um, at the border, it all, it mostly goes to the zoo. It mostly goes to the zoo. And, uh, and they had like, I don't know, several hundred rattlesnakes that somebody was trying to smuggle in. And one of my days, one of my days was, you know, working in the reptile house with the snake handlers with a whole bunch of rattlesnakes. Boy, that must have been a happy bunch of snakes. <laughs> they're beautiful. I mean, they're really cool. And some heal and some heal them on. Gila monsters and beer and Mexican bearded lizards. Yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. Well, um, I went to one rattlesnake roundup when I lived in New Mexico, and I, I kind of enjoyed it. it. It was nice. Yeah, and uh, it's just like uh, the comedian Jerry Clower describes. You know, they stretch the rattlesnake out, they measure yeah. it, uh, they do the around it, the diameter, and everything, and then they take it down to this one part where they put it on a board, and a guy with an axe is and cuts its head off. And J uh, Jerry said, no, that's the part he liked. And I agree. That was a good part. <laughs> okay. Don't you like know, snakes. You, you, know but, what we, you know what we missed to do today, Chris? This was the roll call. We didn't do roll call. That's right. That's right. And there was a, a very, the, the first one, Almond Chris was the very first one in. And he had a great uh, Sasquatch quote quote to live by and i think these are words of wisdom i'm gonna put it up steve go right ahead the real sasquatch was the friends you made along the way that's right <laughs> oh that's good that's good chris that's that's good but uh well we we all know who's in the chat and i want to say hello to all the new folks that are in today uh, oh wait a minute! Before we get happy birthday, Joe. I did. I didn't well, forget you, buddy. I was watching something else. <laughs> yeah, today's old man know. Rivers' birthday. Hello, yeah. happy birthday again, Joe. Uh, <laughs> you know, we we finally uh, we were able to pick up the newspaper uh, off the floor from uh, Professor McGillicuddy's visit this morning. So, so uh, you know, we have to put newspaper down when he shows up, just in uh, case. So, yes, uh, always wise. But okay, we're gonna we'll we'll do roll call towards the end if we have time. Um, uh, okay, so the book. Let's get back to the book first. Yeah, I, I know you have selected a, a passage or two you'd like to read to the audience just to give them a little taste of yeah. their whistle. So I'll let I'll give you the floor. There you go. Okay, so. Um... I think I'll, you brought up that you enjoyed the part um, about um, finding Bigfoot in near my house. So yep. I'll, I'll I'll jump into that um, and then and and just read read for like a couple minutes if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yep, okay. Sure. Um, and there's little sections. I mean, it, you know, one of the really enjoyable things about writing a memoir is you can write whatever you want, right? So there's stuff about my father. There's stuff about you know school. You know, there's you know you can just there's all sorts of topics that we can we can go into. So 
Um, so this is when I was um, 16 years old and we'd um, moved to um, North Louisiana. I grew up in El Paso, Texas, uh, mostly out in the desert. And we moved to uh, North Louisiana um, and um, it kind of blew my mind. You know, I, you, you guys have been around, um, you know, North, the, nor the woods of North Louisiana are really beautiful. There's cypress trees all over the place and moss and all sorts of creatures. So, um, so my, my brother and I, um, he was, he's about seven years older than me, um, spent a lot of time out in the woods, enjoying, enjoying things and enjoying the, <clears throat> you know, enjoying, enjoying what, what's out there. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in, uh, talking about my, my brother and, and me, um, just enjoying the woods out there. So, uh, we loved walking in the woods at night and did it almost every evening. It was especially good when the moon was out. We loved those woods and all the exotic creatures and would wander around trying to triangulate where the owls were roosting based on their calls. We'd bring flashlights, but not because we needed them. We knew every trail and twist in these woods. We'd use them to light up the eyes of the animals we came across. The best part of the game was trying to figure out if it was a deer or a fox or a raccoon. Uh, the coolest size we found were the alligators floating in the lake and ponds. It was an almost prehistoric feeling. The woods could get a little spooky sometimes, knowing that there were snakes and alligators all over. You just never knew what you could run into at night. One time, one of our neighboring fences must have come down, and a creature walked in to graze upon all the fresh pasture. Uh, this was a former farm. It was an abandoned farm that we lived next to, which was just fantastic because there were dams and old buildings and trails and, and ponds and, and that sort of thing. We saw him a, few, a good ways off one night, and it scared the hell out of us. We kept our distance, studying him, trying to figure out what this enormous four-legged, slow-moving creature in the tall grass was. We snuck closer. He did not seem to be intimidated by us, and then, ever so slowly, he raised his big bovine head. Pretty cool, we thought. We didn't expect to find a cow in our woods. The following night, we were out making the rounds again. We had not been to the greenhouse in a couple of days and our ma made our way there with a purpose uh, to check our crops. There was a greenhouse out in the woods and we'd, my brother's a really keen horticulturist, he still is. And so this the abandoned greenhouse, so we started growing all sorts of stuff out there, all sorts of herbs and tomatoes and stuff. So, uh, so we headed out to check our crops. We always walked quiet, quietly and listened. As we approached the greenhouse, we heard a crash. That damn cow had found our secret garden. You can imagine the kind of damage a 1,200 pound cow can do to a garden. We were pissed, but we were also a little afraid of the cat, of the cow. I think I do too much cats. Um, <clears throat> most cows are generally docile, but some breeds are kind of nuts. My brother knew this from his time on the horse farm. We were going to scare this cow, but we were going to do it carefully. We made our plans, Brad, my brother, was in charge. I was going to follow his lead. I felt like I was preparing for combat duty. We just watched the first Terminator movie together the night before. We were going to be cow commandos. Thinking it was a cow was reasonable. We were so wrong. My brother and I stealthily approached our violated greenhouse. Our anticipation was huge. You could hear the creature moving around inside and hear the chomping. I can still hear those crunching sounds to this day. As we approached the dirty glass and struggled to look through, we could see a large shape inside. My brother gave a cool hand signal as if he was the platoon leader, and we silently shifted over a couple of steps to look in through the broken pane. As I stared in, my first instinct was to run, and I would have if not for my brother holding me back. Squatting in our rich soil was an enormous hairy primate chowing down on our carrots. He was pulling out entire clusters by the greens, shaking off the dirt, and munching them down casually. I was a pretty confident nature boy at this point. Snakes, alligators, tarantulas, horses, snapping turtle, they were all just part of my life. I had seen a good bit uh, and had composure when interacting with strange and scary animals. Once, when I was 10, I got to wrestle with a tiger cub at the El Paso Zoo where my mother was a docent, but nothing prepares you from, from standing 20 feet from Bigfoot. Excellent.
Thank you. <clears throat> so this is now. Now we all got to ask: fictional account, real account? Um. So, artistic licensing. A little bit. Okay. It doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah. matter. No, I, I um, know. I, I know you want to keep the air of the book kind of a right. mystery. Yeah. So yeah, we we had jo we had joked about that a few yeah. days ago. Um, yeah. So I spent a lot of time in those woods. I saw some weird stuff in those woods. Um, that my brother and I had been to that greenhouse when something was in it knocking around. I have no idea what that was. Um, I've been camping in those woods when when. Creatures started like rubbing up against the tent that I was leaning against on the backside. I mean, we've all been out in the woods. I know you guys go out and, and do do serious um, work, but we've all been out in the woods and had the hell scared out of us. You know, if you've if you've done it enough, you've heard you've heard sounds that you thought like, yep. does a barred owl can they make those monkey sounds? Like what 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 is go what is going on out here? So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I never, uh, I'll never forget the first barred owl I ever heard doing uh, the the monkey chatter sound. Like, what the hell was that? And yeah. Was, and my son was with me, who knew, uh, who you know is a, you know, obviously he's a New York State Forest Ranger and was Fish and Wildlife Management degree in that. And he was like, "Oh, that's a barred owl." I'm like, "What?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, so very, very uh, <clears throat> fascinating. And if you don't know the sounds of the woods. It, it can make it really a tough time for some people to think that every that little bump in the night's Bigfoot, but right. we, we know it's not. But it's nice to, uh, you know, especially in your position as an author, to kind of imagine what if. And uh, I, I think that's the cool thing about this book uh, is uh, there's a lot of what ifs in there that, you know. And, and the interesting thing is you mix some real life stuff mm -hmm. in with this memoir. It's right. Yeah, people have asked me about the believability aspect of it, and um, you know, I I tried to make it as as casual and as accurate as as possible. Um, you know, my as I said, my brother and I spent so much time in in those woods. Um, you know, the opening chapter is set in uh, Puerto Rico, which is a place I visited uh, several times. Um, you know, where uh, at the start of the the book, I'm I'm brought an injured chupacabra. By a little girl, right? Very, so you you've studied all all of them, uh, you know, uh, or have some knowledge of all of these these creatures, obviously, to get yeah. into to write yeah. a book about this. Yeah, um, well, you know, I not as much as you two, <laughs> but the, yeah. In the early '80s, as a as a teenager, male teenager, when you talk about having a greenhouse out in the woods and yeah. have herbs in there, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm kind of thinking of what what kind of herbs we would have been growing around here yeah. back at that time. <laughs> yeah, no, we were growing that too. <laughs> <laughs> that's in the that's in the book also. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, with a reference to maybe that's why they call them skunk apes. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, let's get into the the, the Bigfoot portion. What? Sure. You know, as you know, you're a scientist, no matter how you cut it. Yeah. Um, what is, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on the existence of a Sasquatch? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've spent um, a good bit of time reading, um, you know, in the middle of Jeff Meldrum's book um, that led to the, the Sasquatch. Um, and I spent a lot of time studying anthropology and history and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I am definitely, uh, you know, on the fence as to, you know, wh where the populations are and how many, how many there would be, um, you know, for people who don't believe in Bigfoot, um, I, I don't think they're as open-minded as they probably should be. Um, you know, there's so many primates out there that it, something like 5% of the primates that have lived on this planet have been identified over the last, you know, 5 million years or something like that. Yeah. Like only, only 5%. I think, I think that's what I was reading in Meldrum's book, actually. Um, yeah. Our, our knowledge is really bad and it's hard to get, it's hard to get all the data. You just, you're just not going to get it. 
Now, if obviously you would think that their physiology would be very similar to other primates. Sure. Yeah. Um, would you have you speculated in your mind that what, um, like for example, there's talk of about a Sasquatch perhaps having a tapetum lucidum. Yeah. Um, what are your, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, in my right. research, there have right. been, you know, they're all lower primates, unfortunately, that have this, uh, that are primates that have a tapetum lucidum. There's no higher primates or, you know, great apes that have a tapetum right. lucidum, obviously. But what, what are your yeah. thoughts going to be an adaptation? Yeah. I don't, I don't think there are any great apes with tapetum lucidums, right? No, not yeah. Terrible. So, so why would you think that, you know, uh, uh like a Japan, what, Gigantopithecus or any other, sort of great ape would have them, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think the, they do. You know, the reason why I ask is because in so many sightings, including yeah. my own, we have this definitive eye yeah. shot that comes back. Yeah. Yeah. The red eyes and all that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah and I, think I think that's hocus pocus. I think that's imagination. I don't think it was oh, imagination. No. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh no. No, it, it's not <laughs> imaginary, my friend. Okay. So here's, so here's, here's the, this this really makes I had this discussion with my wife about an hour ago. Like you guys know so much more about about that aspect of what people have seen and that sort, yeah. But than I do, um, yeah. I mean, so so what are your thoughts? You you think that? Well, I I think that you know bioluminescence. That's what the hocus pocus part of it. Oh, I don't. Yeah. I don't believe because there's no primates that can bioluminesce. Not even yeah. a mammal can do that. Right. How however. There are, I mean, like I said, there are primates that do have a tapetum lucidum. Okay. There are mammals that have tapetum lucidum. So I feel that that, because they're a nocturnal creature primarily, I figured right. that may have been an adaptation, a genetic adaptation over the years, an evolutionary right. type. Of thing. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't you know, know if that's out in left field. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, I guess, I guess the eye and the version of the eye has evolved like it, in 40 different ways or something like that. I don't know if you guys have come across that. So so there's a remarkable amount of, of what eyes have done to evolve. So, uh, yeah. Well, as you know, as a human, uh, we don't have it. We don't, yeah. you can shine a flashlight on our right. eyes and, you know, yeah. you're not going to get a red glow or anything like that, any kind of color. But uh, with... Uh, you get them with cameras with, for some reason though, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's a what they call that the red eye effect. Yeah, the red, yeah, eye, but, yeah. red eye effect. But uh, but that's probably from the 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 light reflected that the the lens can absorb or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I'm not a lensologist yeah. guy. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's the but, blood vessels. I think it's the blood vessels on the back of your yeah. eye that light up a little bit with the camera. But yeah, but uh, it's uh, it's something that it's really common. It's one of my favorite questions to ask the witnesses if they had seen the eye shine, you know, what yeah. color did you get? And a lot of times that varies. Uh, some people will say uh, a red, some people, well, the all, overwhelming majority has been red, hmm. but uh, you'll get some people that say, well, it was kind of orange or kind of yellow. And then some uh, even has reported a blue, you know, a bluish eye shine. Or a greenish. A greenish, oh. greenish. And that's, uh, that's a and, new one on me. You know, And a I, lot I, of that, has to do with the type of light being used, the angle that, of refraction, okay. humidity, right. stuff like that. And this is all nighttime. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. So yeah, that's uh, quite. That that's always been the biggest uh, interest. Now, uh, I'll give you another a little another theory that I want to bounce off your head yeah. too, as well. Is that it seems like a lot of the animal families, the largest in the family, always has the use of infrared. For example, the biggest cats have infrasound. The uh, you know the elephant uses infrasound. The blue whale uses infrasound. Uh, oh. Just to name a few. Um, my thought is, and there's been a lot of discussion about these paranormal effects of Bigfoot stuff like that. My assertion is is that it is that a Bigfoot may have the ability to use infrasound, being the biggest of the primates, and I think. You know, it's consistent because the biggest whales use it, the biggest elephant, and they have their own, believe it or not, I believe there are relatives to the elephant that exist, um, but they have the ability to use infrasound. Obviously, lions and tigers use infrasound. They're the biggest felines. 
And I believe mm. wolves, the biggest canines, can use infrasound as well. Um, so my thought is, why not the biggest primate? It seems like the big, all the, the largest of the mammals have this ability to use that. It would make sense to me that a Sasquatch would use infrasound, uh, being the biggest primate of its you know class. And, and what would they do with it? Well, a lot of people um, will get the feeling of being creeped out. Uh, you know, the hair on the back of the neck with no apparent audible hearing anything. In some cases, people would feel an ear flutter, like the, like a like a vibration yeah. in the eardrum. Um, and it's kind of funny because Chris experienced that first. And I thought he was crazy. Oh. And, then, and then all of a sudden that happened to me at a time when we were, uh, exp when I was experiencing the same type of creeped out type of I'm being watched type of feelings. Um, some people get nauseous. People get messy. I mean, the, the paranormal aspect of it is people think that, you know, I got this feeling to get out of there or this message to get out of there. But wow. these are all legit effects of infrasound. Right. And that's why we're thinking that a Sasquatch may be able to use this because of the size of the creature. Wow. And would they use it like commu for communication with each other? Uh, the, it seems like the most use of this, uh, like the uh, lions, because the blue whale uses infrasound for communication. Yeah. The, the lions and tigers use it to immobilize their prey, give them a, a quick heads up uh, to kind of keep them in place for a second or two while they can pounce. Um, so I believe that the Sasquatch uses infrasound as a defense mechanism mechanism wow. to push them, push people away. That's fantastic. So I, I mean, have no idea why they use it or why they do it or how they do it. Yeah. But they do something. Right. <laughs> so, so like from the veterinary standpoint, you know, infrasound doesn't come into my world at all, you mm -hmm. know. But as the scientists and the biologists, that's fantastic. You know, one of the things I talk with people about, because they think humans are so darn superior and so smart, is that, like, we don't experience the world, like, half as well as the rest of the, the, rest of right. the creatures on this planet. You know, I have discussions with people who, like, leave a light on for their cat when they go away. You know, like, he's nocturnal. Like, like he doesn't need a light, you know? Or, or people will um be surprised when their cat maybe goes blind because that happens um, but cats hear better than we do they smell better they have a better sense of smell they have the whiskers they have better balance you know like we, we live in a really boring it, it when it comes to the animal kingdom our world is really not that interesting compared to the rest of the 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 kingdom um people talk about you know color deficiencies and color blindness like you know, a lot of men have color color blindness, and we you probably know this. That we have the, the three the three cones, right, that help us see the different prisms. Like, there's birds and fish out there that have six and seven different kinds of cones, right? I mean, the things that they see must be amazing. We'll never know what we're missing out on. Well, there's actually there's actually websites that you can go to that say like this is what it looks like when a cat sees things versus you. Oh. Because they, because cool. the the eyes are like farther forward and they have better depth perception and they pick up on movement faster, you know, and they see just as well at night as they do during the day, you know. So you're driving your car at night, you can't hardly see what's going on. If you were a cat, you wouldn't even need headlights. Right. Yeah. You just buzz along. Now, now Lockbeard said that uh, uh, something to the effect of uh, just because it's large, that's no reason to suspect that a Bigfoot can use infrasound. Al contraire, you know, you're not parsing what I said very closely. What I said was, is all the mammals of each species, or each class, I should say, have the ability to use infrasound. All the largest of the, largest the, class, of the yes. classes. Yeah. The that largest. is a commonality amongst all mammals. So why, if Sasquatch being the primate, why would it not have that ability? It's a good solid thought at, uh, behind that theory, considering that people have been throwing around the infrasound theory without using that particular uh, bit of information, is that, geez, just by coincidence, all the largest of all the other classes 
have the ability to use Impress or some of the glasses, like such as canines, felines, and uh, you know elephants and the like, and whales. So it makes sense. Not saying it's a definite. We're just saying that there's a possibility because of this connection with other mammals. So there is a reason. Um, and I agree. If you saw eye shine, there's no reason to think it was Bigfoot, unless of course you have that big uh, thought or you have some other uh, uh, type of activity to go along with it. And I agree with that. Not, not all eye shine is Bigfoot. Uh, I think we actually did a Bigfoot laugh track with a moose. And, uh, you know, people say, oh, Bigfoot being stalked by moose. And this was put out on, on, on the web as being a real Bigfoot video. And you see all of these little eye shines in the back. Very simply, they were just other moose. That's what they were. Um, it wasn't Bigfoot. And, you know, obviously a moose stands tall. So it's the eye shine is way off the ground. But there's no reason to suspect it's Bigfoot. Um, it's probably just other moose is what it is. Yeah. So I know in, if you're in yeah. Kentucky and you see red eye shine, well, you've got uh, about three things to consider, you know, a bear or an owl or a Bigfoot. <laughs> There's... And, and, and Joe, that, that is correct. He says no primate uses infrasound. Prove me wrong. Well, if we get a Sasquatch, <laughs> we may be able to prove you wrong. <laughs> um, no other whales use uh, and for sound, except the blue whale, figure that one. Out. So, and last I checked, a uh, whale was a mammal. So, uh, this is a conversation. It's just a, that, it's just a theory, Joe. It's not proven. Right. right. However, it, 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 I've experienced it and Steve's experienced the same thing. And I and wouldn't it, even thought anything about it. If, uh, Tommy, which was Scott's son, hadn't been standing directly in front of me when we had that encounter and he swiped his ear as he was, he was like, he was batting an insect away at the same time and on the same side to where it hit me at the same time. So I knew, you know, Hey, they're whatever they're doing. They're doing something. Don't know what it is. Okay. Raptor crazy says, all we have is a picture. We can't speculate on something we know nothing about, but we do know a lot about it. <laughs> if we know stuff about primates, and Bigfoot being a primate, wouldn't we know <laughs> some something about Bigfoot? Yeah, you know, and, and that makes perfect sense. You know, I, I it's can't just a theory, but I can't uh, believe I, I, that that you know. Let's face it; we don't need a body on a slab to know. Uh, you know, you you can't say we don't know anything about a species. For example. Do we, do we suspect they're nocturnal? Yes. Why? Because the majority of the sightings have occurred at dusk or afterwards, percentage-wise. Percentage-wise. So that, that's a huge one. Number two, do we suspect they have a tapetum lucidum? Well, yes, by the strong number of accounts of people seeing them, putting the light on them, and having their eyes glow back. Having a tapetum lucidum makes a lot more sense than the alternative saying they can bioluminesce. Number three, can a Sasquatch cloak? Well, obviously not, because aside from the polar bear, which has special characteristics of its hair, right? Uh, you know, no other creature has hair that changes their appearance necessarily uh, or can make them cloak. So you've got to look at all these things logically. The theories I postulate are only one step off of science. They're not two steps off of science or three steps off of science. Yeah. <clears throat> For example, bioluminescence would be a, a, a step because no mammal can bioluminesce. No primate can bioluminesce. No mammal can bioluminesce. Therefore, and, we are two steps out. As well, far as infrasound, no primate can, can emit uh, um, infrasound, but mammals of the largest of their class can use infrasound. Well, so the, that's the why the bioluminescence that right. from the eyes would be a, a common sense thing, too. I mean, you got to think if the eye is making its own light and glowing, uh, that's going to overpower the optic nerve. So, what's going to get back to the brain is like this, you know. <laughs> 
you'll just be totally washed out with light. It won't be able to perceive anything else. Okay, Nick, as you know, I am one of the most rational people out there. Okay. Um, <laughs> what would make me and other people in my party all feel like they're being watched at the same time? Yeah. Um, and then have an ear flutter in their ear. And that is something that occurred to somebody else states away from me at a different time years earlier. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's infrasound or what you would call it, but they definitely can do something to you. Uh, and if you've got like one ear facing them, it'll hit that ear and it won't listen, hit the other. Listen, one. Lock weird. Weird, this is my show. If anybody's going to nip anything in the bud, that's going to be me. End of story. Okay. You're entitled <laughs> to your opinion, but you're not to be all say all sorry. Okay. <laughs> Nowhere near a theory. Well, you know what? If you don't like it, the door's out there. You don't have to well listen to the show. Have a nice day. Um, uh, I just, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sick and tired of people uh, trying to shoot down over 20 years, going on 25 years of research and experiences and try to mm. say, oh, it's not a theory. The hell it's not a theory. In fact, yes. Dr. Jeff Meldrum believes it's possible because it obviously the thick vocal cords of a Sasquatch that allegedly vocalizes miles yeah. likely has the muscular muscularity to use infrasound. That was his reason. Well, you know, that's that's what a theory is. is you know, you're we're we're kind of a tossing around the idea based on the experience of what's happened, you know. And it's not proven? No, of course not. Well, the existence of, of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, is not proven. You know, there's not a body on <coughs> But, uh, uh, you know, they have theories. And uh, that, that's all we got to go by. Now, when we can finally get one on a slab somewhere where we can get somebody who knows what they're doing to cut him open and take a look at the eyeballs. So, uh, <laughs> Mick says that his answer to it is biochemical reactions in the brain as a reaction to what, though, Nick? As a rea you said the word reaction, reaction to what? Because there has to be an action to cause a reaction. So there yeah. was nothing audibly smelled. Was it a, yeah. a, uh, a uh, pheromone release that caused that reaction? Was it um, somebody passing gas in the party, perhaps? Or was it... <laughs> Or was it, you know, infrasound? I don't know. Well, you know what, Steve? I had put a lot of thought into that because uh, that really bothered me. Uh, and I'll tell you what, uh, you know, that wasn't the only time that it happened. Uh, it had happened preceding a sighting before I ever knew because I thought, well, what if I had seen these uh, creatures and my, my pulse, you know, was increasing and I just got a flutter in the ear because of my blood pressure had increased or something of that nature, trying to keep it biologically, uh, logical explanation. <coughs> but there were, there were cases in which I experienced that flutter, had no idea there was one around. And then after I started looking around closely, oh, there he is, you know. So I think they can do something. I, I don't know what it is they're doing, but they, I think they can do something. It goes back to my comments earlier. I think people don't really appreciate what the rest of the animal kingdom experiences. You know, yeah. our our set our sense of hearing, going back to it, is terrible, right. right? I mean, there are all sorts of sounds out there that we don't hear. Our, you know, our vision is is nothing like an eagle's would be. Um, right. You know, you, you guys are outdoorsmen. You you've seen a dog like track. You know, like crazy, crazy, you know, sense, you know, that, you know, like, so I, I mean, I did just kind of, for whatever people are just like shutting the down the definite, you know, the conversation that you shouldn't even be talking. Like we, we're ignorant. We're so ignorant. Some, uh, Am and Chris asked the question, has anybody ever reported a mood change due to infrasound? Well, <clears throat> I can only speak to my own personal experience that I believe it was infrasound, but. 
let's look at the study in the UK that was done in the 70s with it. How about um, uh, the movie Paranormal Activity? That was the found footage movie that they would air. Well, a lot of people didn't know that they had piped in infrasound during, uh, the, they actually put infrasound into that movie soundtrack. So when it was aired in the movie theaters, it gave people definitely mood changes. They went from being happy, caring, going to all of a sudden tense, nervous, yes, um, creeped out, hair in the back of their head, being jumpy. Yeah. So yeah, and the, the studies in the UK would uh, correlate that you know people of the you know have ranged from having nausea, being exposed to infrasound to vibrations in the eyes and ears, which can cause them to hallucinate, can cause them to think they're being spoken to or hear things. Mm-hmm. Now you can understand why the the theory of the possibility of a Sasquatch using infrasound may explain some of these, God, this person sounds credible, but they say Bigfoot told them to get out of the woods, right? Or Bigfoot okay. just disappeared into an orb in front of them. That may be a an experiment. That may actually be a scientific type of explanation yeah. as to why they're having the effect of being hit by the sympathy. Wow! So, for every reaction, every action, there's a reaction. If my memory serves, Steve, I think Billy Willard also had a reaction to infrasound during a sighting. I think, if I remember correctly, he got violently ill. And uh, went down to the ground, or bent over to, or went down to his knees. If I remember correctly, Billy, if you're out there, you know, let us know. I think uh, I believe it was Billy Willard that had a reaction. Well, I, I presume you guys also talk about um, like parallel universes and the multiverse and dark matter and all that sort of stuff. I mean, again, like it, it's so crazy what's out there. Uh, there's uh, Tim Storms can hit notes of infrasound. Well, there you go. If a human can be infrasound. Mm. Really? While well, the chat room's hopping. Ah, uh, Steve, I love your channel. I was <laughs> saying is we have a video, Patty. We have some footprints, but we didn't know what they, they do, or we don't know if they're human or primate. Well, they're not human. Let's get that right out of our mind because their foot structure is different. Their appearance is quite drastically different. They have a lag. They have a neck, but you do not see it. Like it's like a gorilla type of neck with the, you know, with the high peak. They have a sagittal crest in some of the sightings. Um, flat nose, lack of ear lobes, hair covered, uh, larger. Um, you know, sounds like to me that this is not a human. Genetically, it wouldn't be possible to have all those types of variations in one creature and say that it's human there would be a, a deviation from human DNA. Not saying it may not be the closest thing to us, but saying that that it's not quite human. And I agree, too. <laughs> he said, I believe in different dimensions, but I don't think they apply to Bigfoot any more than they do to deer, and I agree. And... Uncle Bowen says, not a monkey. Well, obviously, it's not a monkey. It doesn't have a tail. <laughs> um, I'm not I'm not a big subscriber to quantum physics as it re- applies to Bigfoot. I don't think necessarily two are related. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do have a physics degree, so people ask me these sorts of questions. So I, I, I got a mechanical engineering degree when I was a teenager. I, I thought I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. Um and then I really that love- is that is incorrect. When you say <laughs> the word, when you say the word primate, like I said, there are primates. There's twelve species that have a tapetum lucidum. Tarsiers are one of them. So uh, pri- there are primates that do have eyes that reflect light. They're not any one of the great apes to which homo sapiens are considered the great mm. apes. So that, that, that statement is, is not correct. Let's get on page. Folks. Let's get the reality out that, that not saying this is fact, but saying this, these are some theories that need to be 
explore. Yep, and lemurs too. Yeah, Joe agreed. Yeah, lemurs. So when you when we say primates, you know, and, and that's that's the the one thing that that people get very confused. They say the word primate, they automatically mm -hmm. think monkey. They hear the word great ape, and they automatically think monkey. But that's not the case at all. Um, you know, uh, if you think a chimpanzee is a quote-unquote monkey, it has 94.6% of human DNA. 94.6% of their DNA matches ours. Yeah, but there's a lot in that, you know, three points. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Even if a Sasquatch was... 97 or 98 percent of our dna yeah. uh, that two percent could make some big changes but it would yeah. not make it a human being and obviously to have the physical traits that are observed on a constant and consistent yeah. basis my thoughts on that would be how can it be human it doesn't act like a human it doesn't walk like a human it doesn't uh, it doesn't leave tracks or have a footprint like a human being Therefore, it must not be human. You know, it doesn't quack like a duck. It doesn't walk like a duck. Therefore, it's not a duck. Yeah. Well. Uh, oh, lock beard. No. <laughs> ah, yeah, Steve, Tapetum lucidum. Yes, there are 12 species of primates that have Tapetum lucidum. Oh, and if chessboard's saying reflecting light, you know, as far as bioluminescence, if you're saying that, I agree, because no mammal can bioluminesce their eyes and light up. And I, I know uh, that uh, Don Fuller had said, didn't the owner of the Skeen Valley Country Club, when he had his sighting, say that the lights illuminated, that, that almost like they were laser beams. But then again, if it's a foggy, misty night, which in that particular area of Whitehall can get... Um, seeing that bioluminescence, or not bioluminescence, but seeing that reflection off the tapetum lucidum could cause mm -hmm. them to think that they were projecting. No, I, I, there's a difference between opposes my point of view and being trollistic. And when you start saying to me, no, that's not a theory, now you're starting to become a disruption to the show. You're starting to become a disruption to that. If you say, hey, I disagree with you, okay, I, I, I don't believe this is a valid theory for whatever reason, that's fine. But don't turn, me around, don't turn around and tell me that's not a theory. It's a theory. And I'm entitled to it, just like you're entitled to believe what you want to believe. Simple as that. So decorum, tact. Tact is the point art of getting your point across without making an enemy. Remember that. So. so, Chris, you have questions for Dr. Tim? Uh, hang on just a second, Steve. <laughs> there we go. Okay. 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 I'm back. <laughs> so, Doctor Tim, do you yeah. treat cats? And do you treat big cats as well as like house cats? Um, it's well, it's it's pretty exclusively house cats. Um, there are some people. Uh, in the area that have um, have like um, uh, servals and yes. caracals that are like almost pets, and those are like forty pound African cats. So I've treat I've treated some of those. Um, I mean, there are there are some cats at the Buffalo Zoo, but I I haven't I haven't I haven't helped the Dr. Boley there with them. So no. Very cool. I think. Uh... Yeah. Just like uh, the venomous snakes, I think I would draw the line at tigers. You know, uh, no tigers. Uh, yeah. Anything. I, as a student, anything. I spent I spent a day at the zoo. They would pair you with a handler for the day, so you would work with like the 
the big cat handlers or the snake handlers. And, and I spent a day with um, the big the big cat handlers, and uh, they're they're um, they're kind of creepy, you know, just by their size and and just the fact that you could be lunch for them if you like don't lock the gate properly behind you, you know. So yeah. That's my wife. Okay. Can you talk about these creatures in terms of medicine? I wonder if that would be treating them. Yeah. Well, I mean, treating so a, a large, wounded one. Yeah. So a large part of the book is obviously the the veterinary aspect of it, the medical aspect right. of it. Um, uh, you know, I talked about um, the, the 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 chupacabra that was brought to me in the, in the at the start of the first chapter. Um, you know, in, in many ways, um, that creature was treated like a like a bird would be that had, um, had you know, it, as, as, a, as a veterinarian, people will bring you like little birds they find on the street, you know, that have like fallen out of a nest or um, the, the peregrine falcon that we, we treated when I was a student. He had simply uh, fallen out of off of a skyscraper in the city of Boston, you know, so a lot of times. Um, you, know, you just have to use the common sense. Uh, uh, it, it, a lot of people find birds that have, say, flown into windows and knocked themselves unconscious. Um, so that that is kind of the gist of the the first chapter. Is you know if you if you come across an injured chupacabra, you know as as the veterinarian, uh, you know you go you run through your list of what um, you usually do to try to make a diagnosis. You know you look for signs of trauma. You look for uh, like weight loss. Does he look like he's been starving? Um, yeah, so that, that, that's um, probably the, in many ways the most enjoyable part of, of this book is the is the medical aspect of it. Um, you know that we're all that we all need someone looking out for us. That we all need care. Um, the the other part of the book that 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 I really um, and I didn't set out to do this, but as I wrote it, it became more of a discussion of respect for the the, the creatures on this planet and. And um, and you know what we're doing to to make life harder for, for them, um, and the parallels. And I've heard other people say this. I know you guys in other other podcasts have talk talk about um, you know wolf populations or um, you know bear populations, and a lot of the same principles that apply to um, providing good habitat for uh, a sasquatch would you know be be good for bears you know or wolves. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's what gets me, um, uh, some of the, some of the, uh, documentaries I've watched, especially uh, about the Pacific Northwest, uh, and some of the, uh, professional scientists that they had there, uh, were saying things like, well, obviously there's not enough calories, uh, uh, to support a large mammal in this yeah. area. And, you know, what gets me is that that area that they're in right at that moment is populated by bears. Yeah. And so right. I, I'm thinking, well, who, who <clears throat> didn't tell this person right. there's bears living there because obviously right. they're getting something to eat. <laughs> yeah. You wonder, well, you wonder what that person's background is or whether they right. have studied wildlife biology or know a ranger or, right. or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, um, there's bears in Buffalo that show up from time to time. You know, we live on the uh, on the Pennsylvania border uh, and down into the Allegheny region, like bears, you know, there's huge bear populations down there and they wander up on the train tracks and show up in suburban Buffalo, you know, cause they get driven out by their mother. Like, okay, it's time to go on. And, you know, so like anybody that's saying that the, they, they can't, those, uh, that territory can't support that population is, is delusional. Right. Yeah. yeah, we didn't have, uh, well, at, at one point in central Kentucky, we had a large, large population of bears. And yeah. I guess the locals had killed them out. I mean, you know, this was a long time ago. Yeah. So no, most of the bears in Kentucky now are actually over in the eastern section of the state. Okay. And in central Kentucky, south central Kentucky, hardly ever see one. But a couple of years ago, uh, you know, somebody filmed one running across an open field, you know, like, Look, it's a black bear. You know what? What's that doing here? And I was like yeah. two miles from my house. Yeah. So I think I think some of these things can move back into areas. You know, 
Mm. Well, they absolutely have. Yeah, they absolutely have. And you, you, a lot of people talk about the cat populations too, the large cat right. populations, and how they've migrated a, around, and how they, you know, get they get lost or they get driven out, and they, you know, they show up they show up in places where people weren't expecting to find them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they had a, a very big issue here locally at Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, the national park. Yeah. I've been there. Uh, people were spotting large cats in the area. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, the, the, the park superintendent was just like, uh, every time he would get a report, he would just, you know, dr- brush it away. Oh no, they, they probably saw somebody's dog, you know, no, right. It can't be, there's no large cats in the park. Right. And that went on for a long time. And until, uh, the staff that worked in the main office had one jump on their car in the parking lot of the main, uh, the building where everybody worked at. Yeah. And they came inside and said, Hey, you know, they're here. We've, yeah. we've got yeah. a big cat here. Yeah. Uh, was, and then they finally it, did. Put was it on like a, the parking lot surveillance camera or where, what, how? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know if they got it filmed or not. Yeah. But the, I know the, the staff saw it either jumped yeah. on a car or jumped over a car in the parking lot while they were going into work. Oh my God. And they reported that and they said, well, look, you're going to have to make some kind of announcement here, you know, to let people know wow. there is a big cat. Yeah. And sure enough, they took out a small ad in, in a news in the local newspaper. Well, you know, we're not saying there have been reports that they've had a sighting here of a large cat. So here's what to do in case you encounter one, you know, yeah, make yourself big. And, and it went through the whole rigmarole. Yeah. But, uh, well, I mean, the, the challenge with large cats is you don't see them coming. You know, you hear about people, you know, out hiking in right. California and, you know. I saw a documentary not too long ago about a man riding a mountain bike. And I think he was in California. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got attacked from the back. Never saw it coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the way that the cats do. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they get you on the back of the neck. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, they know what they're doing. <laughs> they're very, for it. Very yeah. efficient predators. Yeah. Well, what got you into cats? I know you start specializing in cats rather than dogs and, and yeah. farm animals and stuff. Did you I have? Do, uh, do you feel like a personal cats. connection with them? Yeah, I do love cats. I've always I've always loved cats, um, and I, I think it was cats that made me, you know, tip the scales that I was going to go to vet school when I was about twenty five. You know, I just have have a love of them. Um, you know, they're 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 wild. You know, there's a, there's certain there's you know they they can never really be domesticated, but they can still live in your house. You right. know, and they they're they're you know they're, they're smart and I and uh, yeah I, I I do love cats. I I spend I spend most of my day with them. I go to work and I get cats all day, and yep. then I have cats at home. So yep. yeah, I'm, I'm I... pretty much up to my up to my eyeballs and cats yeah i'm with you i am a cat person i love cats and don't get me wrong you know the the wife has yorkies and although i'm not really really crazy about dogs you know i love her little yorkies they can get into your heart mm-hmm. but not like a cat a cat yeah. you know i had a a big big orange cat called morris and he's no longer with us but i sure do miss him but he was a uh, a great cat. I mean, he uh, he always appreciated. Anytime you come in, uh, cats make the best companions because yeah. it doesn't matter. You come in two a.m., three a.m. in the morning. They don't care where you've been. Right. They don't care what you've been doing. They just love you. You know. Yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm a dog person too. I mean, I like both of them, but yeah. 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 And I, we've had rabbits. I've had. As a kid, you know, we had um, guinea pigs and all sorts of stuff. So, right. uh, and I've had, you know, roommates with birds and, you know, I, I, and I love birds. I, but it's probably my favorite hobby is, is, you know, going out and hiking and bird watching and, you know, trying yeah. to see something interesting out there. Yeah. Well, getting back to the, the Bigfoot discussion. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. We got kind of sidetracked there, Steve. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as, as, as a medical doctor, what, mm-hmm. what I know it's been said that these creatures would require several thousands of calories per day to survive or exist. Right. Uh, what would you speculate 
that they would eat? Do you think they would eat mostly plants, or do you think they would be uh, meat eaters or uh, just like uh, omnivores? You know, whatever is around, they shove it yeah. in their mouth. What yeah, would I mean, be your opinion? I think they'd be. I think they'd be omnivores, and I think they would probably eat seasonally of what was available, just like just like a bear or other creatures would. I mean, I don't see them sitting around in this part of the world, you know, munching on what mountain gorillas do and having those big fat, like digesting bellies. I think they'd, right. they'd have, they'd have a, a diet similar to what you would have if you were, were making it surviving out in the woods. Right. Yeah. I think they'd eat berries. I think they'd, you know, catch, you know, catch fish, you know, well, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Meldrum had, had a theory that perhaps uh, these creatures could possibly have a longer gut. Uh, okay. So they would be able maybe to, uh, in theory, you know, they would be able to digest roughage that, you know, although maybe we, we couldn't digest and get the most nutrients out of it, but they possibly could. So that would free them up to have more plants and eat more plants than we would normally be able to eat and survive on. Yeah. But I also do believe they'd eat meat. Uh, yeah. Because they're, they're often found in population with uh, right. areas with a high, high deer populations and high, uh, was it, uh, the hog populations like over at, okay. uh, yeah. Elk, Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the hog populations mostly new though. Right. Um, with the introduction and, well, the, the, the yeah, I don't over, know, I don't know that I ever car. try to take down a boar myself. That <laughs> seems like maybe a Sasquatch, maybe a Sasquatch is brave enough to do it, but those, those creatures scare me pretty bad. Well, while I was talking on or the area around Falk, Arkansas, where that, uh, oh, yeah. the creature from Boggy, yeah. yeah, Boggy Creek. Yeah. The Boggy Creek creature. And they, they have wild boars that have been living there. They're, uh, mm -hmm. okay. for long, long periods of time. And the recent documentary I watched about it today, they had a guy that was talking about the the pig population there that the, there was really uh, plentiful. So, hmm. uh, like deer, you know, I'm, I'm sure that would could be considered a food source. But uh, I'm with you though. I believe they're omnivores. I, I think whatever is available, they're going to shove it in their mouth. You know, it, from tree bark to deer meat, whatever they can find, they can eat. Okay, Mick. Several thousand calories or a slice of my ex mom's nuclear meatloaf. Okay. okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I don't know, Mick. They would probably like enjoy the meatloaf. Uh, I don't know about that. Give them some nuclear waste, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, no, Tim. Tim Halloran says mice, moles, snakes, birds, lizards, frogs, rabbits. Now, Tim, I'm sorry, but I draw the line at snakes. I would probably not, and and lizards, and lizards. No snakes, no lizards. You know, I could probably stand frog legs. Uh, it's kind of yeah. creepy when you think about it, but have you ever ate one, really? I have. I don't like them. Well, you know, it, it's one of those things you can't think about it. You just kind of think it's a, it's a really long, skinny chicken leg. <laughs> not chicken though. No, but, no it's not it's like eating but snails eating a snake okay. uh, that, that that's just not for me i mean snails I snails oh snails either no 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 that's not for me either i was always paranoid about snails so. i've had alligator though yeah yeah well down in louisiana you know people will eat just about anything from you know, squirrels to the frog legs to, um, you know, the alligators to the turtles to, yeah, I, I, I had a pretty, and the crawfish, of course, right? They just grow in, you know, just live in the ditches there. They throw out netting and, you know, come back the next day and have a, have a boil and have a big party, you know, with these little, these little spicy, lo you know, freshwater lobster, basically. So, yeah, yeah they're, 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 uh, a different kind of vor down in, uh, not even sure what to call, not even yeah. sure what to call by my, my, uh, my people down there in Louisiana. If you get enough garlic and cayenne on it, you know, it's going to be pretty good. 
Well, that Louisiana food, uh, the Cajun food, oh my gosh, that stuff is spicy. I thought Thai food was spicy, but uh, man, those guys can really pepper stuff up. Yeah. But it's Never, good. Uh, yeah. So I'm, work, I'm working on a story about uh, the Cajun werewolf. I don't know if you guys know, uh, like you guys seem to know everything about the Rougarou, the Cajun the werewolf. Rougarou. Yep. Yeah, there's a Rougarou festival in Homa. That I need to get down to one of these days. So, yeah, yeah. The Cajun, the Cajun werewolf is, uh, you know, it's it's I, a classic werewolf story with like uh, Lent and all sorts of other things thrown into <laughs> it just to make it just to make it weirder and funnier. <clears throat> you know that that's another question I have. Uh, the The dog man to me seems a little bit of a stretch of it walking upright. Yeah, because yeah. the leg. You know, they say, oh, it has canine legs in the back. It's just standing up. And yeah. those legs are not meant to be walk bipedally. Certainly not right. support that kind of yeah. weight all the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, would that be kind of an accurate statement? I would think so. Yeah. And, and, the, and the creatures in my book are the believable ones, you know. Um, you know, it's not that much of a stretch to think there are jackalopes out there, you know, little... You know, a lot of creatures grow antlers, so why can't uh, why can't a rabbit do it? You know, and um, in part, in one of my chapters, I work at a mermaid conservation institute about halfway through the book, right? And um, that gives me an opportunity to go to to Newfoundland, right? And talk because I love Newfoundland. Um, spent three years of my life there studying the ocean physics, and what a what a better place to be a mermaid, you know, with all the cod and you know, all the resources there than, uh, than, than Newfoundland. And, um, you know, going back to what we were saying uh, a few minutes ago, uh, you know, Newfoundland, uh, used, uh, the ocean there used to be a pretty magical place as far as the productivity. Um, you know, the stories of hundreds of years ago, you didn't really have to go fishing. You just threw a bucket into the water and cod would come up. But, um, you know, the, the same things that have devastated the cod industry and the the right whales have also uh, hurt the mermaid population too. You know, it's um, it's kind of hard to live out there with all the pollution and climate change and uh, you know, irresponsible fishing and and that sort of thing. I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if they ever got the big plastic pe uh, part of the uh, ocean cleaned up over out in the Pacific. Uh, what do they call that? The the trash ring yeah. or something? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Supposed to be a guy, and I can't remember what his name was. Uh, built a machine to clean that up, to clean all the plastic up out there yeah. in the big garbage patch. And I don't know how he's doing. It's been a while now. Maybe he's got it cleaned up. I hope he does. Well, there's a lot of those actually. I actually spend a lot of my time volunteering with Waterkeeper. Um, oh. You know, which um, you know, they're they're all over the world. They're all over the country. Right. Uh, they're really active in 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 the Great Lakes area. Um, because there's so much legacy pollution and and you know so many so many problems in in this part of of the state, um, but they actually um, there's a guy who builds trash wheels. There's one in Baltimore, out in the harbor there. They just mm -hmm. they just skim trash all day, and they're solar powered. They they installed a couple of them in in the Buffalo Harbor recently too. So I mean, people are working on this from a variety of levels. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge problem. I mean, it would seem like the smart thing to do would be to just not throw it in, <coughs> in the first place. But um, you kind of, with a problem like that, you kind of have to work at it from both ends. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think it's all to blame on uh, the previous generation because uh, you got little, uh, what's her name? Greta. Wait a minute. Greta oh, Thorn Thornburg, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's very passionate about uh, about the environment, and that's great. Everybody should care about the environment. But when she gets so emotional and she says stuff like, "How dare you? Yeah, you know, ruin the environment with your plastic." Yeah, and you know, I just, I, I just wish I could talk to this girl because I would tell her, Greta, <clears throat> honey, it's not my generation. We drank from returnable glass bottles. Yeah. We drank our water from a faucet in a glass. We didn't drink out of plastic bottles. Uh, you know, if we had a straw in school, it was made out of paper. Yeah. Uh, our milk cartons were uh, waxed paper cartons. 
So, you know, perhaps uh, somebody of a little bit later generation may have had a little more to do with it than than my generation. And, and do you know why? And, and most of us in our generation had nothing to do with it, even the later generation. It's the bean counters that said, hey, there's a cheaper way yeah. of doing yeah. this. Let's That's provide it. that vehicle. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. We can make three cents more on the dollar yeah. if we do it this way. And damn sure, we're killing the environment, but so what? That's three cents, man. Yeah. Well, somebody's going to pay for it eventually, you know, so. Yes. So anyhow, back to our favorite topic. Can I say something tonight that somebody's not going to snap at me about? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what. If I seem a little crass, uh, uh, yeah, I've had that kind of week this week, so I apologize if I seem to be a little crass. Uh, people have been jumping on me for things this week, and I'm not yeah. pro. I, I mean, I don't mind discussion, but please don't yeah. invalidate yeah. my beliefs or theories because I certainly don't invalidate yours. You're entitled to believe. You want to believe Bigfoot is a human? You're entitled to believe that. I disagree. This is the reason why I disagree. Yeah. Don't tell me that I'm invalid or that's not a theory or anything like that. That's what puts people in timeouts when they don't want to discuss why. They just want to gaslight. And when people gaslight, out they go. And for a little time, just to reconsider their position. And that's the reason why I did it. So, um, well. Yeah, and the thing is, I, we, I have I, I have no problems with disagreement or some good constructive talking, but don't tell me that mine is not a theory when in fact it is. Oh yeah, well you know the, we've uh, Steve and I have collaborated on this this one over the years. Well, we've collaborated and, uh, a number of things. Yeah, but but you see that that's where. You know, like there's people that, that believe Bigfoot shape shift and do whatever. And okay, I have a thousand reasons why they're wrong, but I don't tell them that they're invalid. I tell them that you're you're wrong. Now I may have fun with other theories. I may have fun with stuff like that. All good. And that's that's how we have a good discussion. And the reason why I put that gentleman in 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 because he was gaslighting by saying, "Oh, that's not." A theory and yada yada and that's why hoaxers. that's the same thing that the people that defend the hoaxers say we got to get out of that mindset we got to engage not you know put somebody down and and that's you know by saying that you're putting the person down that you're saying that to. that's not a theory well you're putting me down instead of saying i disagree with that theory. now you understand why i did so, enough said about that. We move on. <laughs> I believe, Charlie. I believe. <clears throat> Charlie Wonton mm -hmm. has a lot of wise, wise words. <laughs> oh, man. So, I, I, you know, and I've been very, very. I was just aware of not trying to gaslight um, or try to, you know, shut somebody down or be negative towards them or their beliefs. You know, it's something that um, uh, obviously could have, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're getting to that in the Bigfoot community where, uh, you know, it's getting as polarized as hmm. the political spectrum sometimes. Hmm. So yeah, we don't we don't do politics, right? Not in Bigfoot either. <laughs> <laughs> now there are a lot of different uh, ideas about what these creatures can do and what they cannot do. Some people seem to think different things, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. I just you know Steve and I don't entertain anything outside the point of the creatures being biological living beings mm. that capable of doing what a biological living being can do. Correct. Uh, because quite frankly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a skeptic and I know Steve is too. I mean, he, he, you know, 
uh, we're going to look at it from the skeptic's point of view. Uh, we can only theorize about what we've seen and what we've experienced and the notes we've taken on the observation. And experiences. And right. yeah. experiences. And experiences, right. Reports, you know, observation. And it's and, not and, a... Uh, it's, it's not, not like thing. I'm coming out. It's not like I'm no. coming out of left field on any of the stuff. No, 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 no. It took no. me a long time to get from point A to point B. That's for sure. Because when I came into this, pardon the expression, but I thought everything was bullshit. Hmm. You know, and that's the, you know, uh, the There's bottom a lot line. Be- a lot behind the scenes you guys don't see, but it, you'll see it one of these days. You'll see it. You know, there's a, there's a one of the chapters in my book is is set in. In Newfoundland, and involves fairies actually, um, oh. which, you know, that's a hard one to prove. You know whether fairies whether fairies exist. So, um, and you know we have such a large amount of literature and on, on fairies, right? You're going back for you know for centuries. So yeah. Um, and you know I didn't I didn't realize how strong the fairy culture was in, in Newfoundland. Um, the, the university that I studied at there, Memorial University, their folklore department actually had a separate department on fairy culture and all the, the sightings of it and the belief in oh, it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, and, you know, that's it. Um, later on, later on in the book, and, you know, I talked about, you know, believability, you know, as far as presenting your story, just so, you know, so, because, because if it's, obviously it's more enjoyable if you start believing, you know, that, that you know, these, these things are, are real. Um, but when it comes to fairies, I mean, it's basically just, you know, enjoying, which, enjoying the history of it. You right. know, which which brings sort of me thing. to the next interesting thing about Bigfoot is people saying Bigfoot braiding a horse's hair. And there's been reports by another veterinarian, <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Melba- Dr. Melba Ketchum, who says, oh, wait, you must have been Bigfoot braiding my horse's hair. Uh, you know, our our good friend, Mr. Duffy, 81, oh. said the Bigfoot braid. But for generations, there have been something called fairy knots. And really? I guess in England, they used to say either the witches or the fairies were right. braiding the horse's hair. Right. But what it turns out to be is, I guess, when horses kind of rub against one another sometimes, yeah, their manes get knotted up. Sure. Okay. And that's what people, you know, have been attributing this to Bigfoot and to other things when it's a very common occurrence. So so Bigfoot comes to your pasture and braids your horse's hair? That's what some have said. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> like a French braid or what what are we what are we doing here? And the tail too? The tail yeah, and maybe the, a corn and roll. And... I, I a corn wow. roll, I don't know. I, okay. Uh, I love I love you guys. This is great. <laughs> I, I I've, 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 learned all, I've learned all sorts of stuff tonight. <laughs> but that's some of the reports. Do we believe there, there have been reports? Off. Yes, there have been reports. Okay. Well, you guys are in pretty deep. Wait, wait. I, I, no, spent, no, no. I spent 40 hours uh, a week at a, at a veterinary practice. Yeah. So I don't I don't get all this stuff. No, no. Uh, when, when that comes, uh, when it comes to stuff like that, like somebody says, Bigfoot is braiding a horse's mane. Yeah. That's where I draw the line. I'm saying, well, yeah. I'm sorry. That that has that's straight out of left field. Has nothing to do yeah. with what I know for research. I'm sorry, I just can't go there. So, do, they, <laughs> do they send it to you as though it's proof? Like who else could have done it but Bigfoot? You know, I, that's the thing. You know, uh, I, I didn't see it myself, so yeah. I, I I don't. Uh, I really yeah. can't subscribe to that theory, but it's possible. You okay. know, I, I, I don't know. As as a mischievous teenager, I used to braid my neighbor's horse's hair, his her mane. You know, I would just be out like two o'clock in the morning. Horse would come up to the fence. I'd have apples and carrots, and we'd spend some quality time. And I would braid the mane, and we thought it was pretty damn funny because we knew they were going to see it in the morning and think, "What in the hell happened to my horse last night? Where, where, where have you been?" <laughs> so, yeah. No, Tim, uh, Dr. Tim, they would said they probably said, "Oh my God, it's right. Bigfoot." Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I learned something at, like almost every day with this stuff. Like, I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is only like half an hour from Boggy Creek. 
right. right from very folk. cool right and you know i you know so when i looked at the when i watched the movie when i look at the documentaries of it i'm like wow that's where i used to go like right near where you used to go water skiing and swimming and that sort of thing so yeah it's totally yeah yeah ah, lockbeard is he still on that, that yeah he's coming back for <laughs> Another oh. censorship device, those who cannot stand with sans scrutiny, the, disabling the dislike button. I've never disabled anything. No. <laughs> you can still give us a thumbs down. I see them when sure. they come in. You just can't see the likes versus dislikes mm. on the channel because people weaponize it. That's why. Hmm. Yeah, there was a question about the different kinds of um, um, Bigfoot-like creatures, too. I think that went right on by. I think that was with the... Um, there was somebody commenting on, like, yet the difference between Yetis and, you know, uh, oh, Bigfoot and all yes. that. And, you know, I'm, I'm reading Gareth Patterson's book, uh, Beyond the Secret Elephants. I don't know if you guys have read that. No. He's fantastic. He's fantastic. He's a primate and elephant researcher in South Africa. You know, he's a biologist and a wildlife biologist. And, um, you know, he's, he, I, I'm only part way into the book, but, you know, in, in his, because he found a, a, um, an unknown species of elephant in South Africa, that was like 15 years ago, in, in some really deep bush there, that where, the na where the locals have been saying, like, there's definitely a different kind of elephant here, and nobody believed him. And then he continued mm -hmm. researching and looking into it. And he discovered a, a, a third species of elephant called the Nisna. And, um, and, and then he also saw some sort of hominids out there that he couldn't really explain. So, so I'm, in the, I'm halfway through the book. It's really, it's, he's a beautiful writer and it's just, you know, and he's, a, he's very, yeah, there he goes. Yeah, Otang, so someone's helping us out. Yeah. Is so, Bigfoot different from a Yeti or is one Arctic and the other yeah. one isn't? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Well, so I think I think you know this has been a, a journey for me. Um, you know, it's exposed me to a, a lot of different things, and I think the, the the most enjoyable one of the most enjoyable experiences I had I was out for dinner in Dallas with my with my mother, my eighty something year old mother, and I was wearing actually the same shirt that you posted on your on your link there with the gone squatching, oh. which everybody loves that shirt. Um, and I am from Minnesota too. My family came from Minnesota, and the guy serving us at a Nepali Indian restaurant in suburban Dallas was obsessed with Yetis. And he was about 65 years old or so. And he had been in the N Nepali military and on maneuvers in the Himalayans. He had seen, he was, he, and so when he, when I had this shirt on, he was just like obsessed with, with like, he, all, it's all he wanted to talk about. He almost didn't, he almost stopped like, serving us because he wanted to talk about his experience with out you know out in the middle of nowhere right. it was great well i gotta say i've seen the the photos and the of the yeti footprint and the toe structure is quite a bit different from what the those purported to be sasquatch or bigfoot yeah, yeah. Uh, in the united states is <clears throat> so i don't know if they would be different or not but uh Obviously, well, their foot uh, construction <laughs> is definitely a little different. Of course, it could have been that one creature, if that's what it was. Or, well, you know, that's, those could have been, instead of a Yeti, those could have been footprints from a, a bear. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that was the one uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Brian Sykes, I think, he, he found uh, uh, evidence, DNA evidence of an extant bear hmm. which was purported to be bigfoot hair but it come out to be a bear that's right a mixture between a polar right. bear and a brown bear i think i'm not hmm. certain. yeah or nepali's bear but uh yeah they do have a different looking foot for sure <laughs> certainly um well a yeti is just another term uh, and the, uh so yeti are not north american then it's not a no. term used for uh, a north american uh 
Um, no. Uh, they're used in Tibet. They're used in Nepal. Uh, uh, the whole abominable snowman was mm -hmm. uh, that the use of that particular term was actually a mistake, a misinterpretation yeah. by right. a reporter yes. that caused that to come out as the abominable snowman. Good. Yeah. Um, I think what else? Um, but, you know, they all share a lot of the same characteristics. Some are different. Some may actually be another type of species, such as the orang pendek, which is seen right. a little bit differently. The orang pendek of Malaysia is seen in Vietnam as well, uh, is seen a little bit different than a Sasquatch. It's much smaller. It has some other unique things that are unique to them than what's been reported here in North America. Um so I, I think, uh, you know, the Yeren pretty much matches up. The Yowie pretty much matches up. The Almas, which is in, uh, well, the Yeren is China. The uh, Almasti or the Almas of uh, Russia matches up very similar to right. the, uh, the, the Sasquatch or Bigfoot. <coughs> you know, Sasquatch obviously uh, was first coined by J uh, in 1924 by Canadian journalist J.W. Burns. Uh, off the uh, Sasquatch, uh, off the I believe the name, the actual term Sasquatch. Um, so uh, you know, and then Bigfoot came obviously from the 1958 Jerry Crew sighting, which yeah. actually said a new yeah. type of Sasquatch is found. It's called Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot was in big, big letters. So, and uh, Joe says that Orang Pendek thinks uh, it may be Homo. Little people, the hobbits. <laughs> Good one, Joe. So, people thought the the you know the stories of the little people were. Uh, <laughs> Joe keeps saying those fairy big tales. Words. And, mm -hmm. As it turned out, uh, sure enough, Homo floresiensis. They found the bones of little people. But, uh, you know, it there. makes perfect sense to have a, you got a small uh, land mass there that the uh, the people living there are going to grow smaller and not larger. Of course, how about the Mapanguari of South America? Mapanguari, yeah. Wow, we had some great episodes on that one. Yes. <laughs> we actually had a, a gentleman on who was part of a, uh, a ranger detachment who him and his... Uh, Uh, the, uh, the yeah, his squad, did... right? He got separated from his squad on a mission out there in the jungle in the middle of nowhere. How long was it? Twenty-one days or something 20, like that. Twenty-two days, something like that. He was twenty-two separated. days. They thought he was he was listed as missing in action. <laughs> he was lost in the jungle. But uh, him and his squad actually had a sighting of a mapanguari, and uh, mapanguari is described as a very sloth-like. Um, yeah, Raptor Crazy says, uh, Cliff said that he found out, Cliff Barrickman had found out that some people there were sending him false information. He said it was a hoax. But I can't believe that the entire Orang Pendek uh, mystery is a hoax because that's been reported for years as well. That would be like saying, you know, will Rick Dyer fake the Bigfoot and, you know, whatever, and you know, all the other cast of assortments so of Bigfoot's got to be fake. So there's got to be some truth to it. For yeah. them to hoax it, um, if they came up with some amazing creature, or somebody says, "Oh, look, this is a picture of a unicorn," and they have a horse with a, you know, whatever strapped to their head, they have it, yeah, and you know, and it's just a one-off, and there's no other reportings of unicorns, then I'd be a little mis misguided to say, "Oh, it's a hoax." But um, for the entire phenomenon to be a hoax, um, I mean, look at the Loch Ness monster. Um, even the surgeon photo, which was in, I think, 1931, uh, that turned out many, 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 many years later to be a hoax. Um, you know, but that didn't genius, take away. <clears throat> genius. For the Boy, time, yeah. yeah. For the time, yeah. Yeah, but, for that time. Uh, but for... for uh, now you can years, go by people, any... Obviously, that, that got spurned by a, an authentic event of people seeing something in the lock. So there is something to that mystery, but what it is, I don't know. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the lake monsters, sea monsters, they persist everywhere. You know, people. Uh, actually, there is. I uh, keep seeing them all over the place. You know, how, how, much, how much evidence is there for the existence of the Mapanguari? Well, truthfully, <clears throat> uh, the Mapanguari is just the South American version of Bigfoot. But the funny thing is, is that tribes from the Amazon on one side of uh, the the Amazon were talking about it, and so were ones on the west side that had never communicated. So they were both seeing the same thing, describing it very similarly. Uh, there have been Mapanguari sightings. I don't think we cover them as much as we do because we don't have uh, necessarily the uh, hmm. w the presence of a Mapanguari. We don't talk about Mapanguari too much here in the United States. It doesn't mean it's like Orang Pendek, Yaren. What's the existence of Yaren? Can you, can you, off the top of the head, give me 10 Yaren sightings? You can't well, you know, because if it, you it's look at specific it, to a, a particular culture. Yeah, I think if you look at the Bigfoot mystery as a skeptic, there are a few things that are hard to explain. And one of them is why are there so many names uh, from so many different cultures, different names, but they all describe almost exactly the same uh, hairy creature that now you see, looks like a man. It's, it's that really Mick is gaslighting. <laughs> That's gaslighting. Present the evidence that uh, there's very little evidence. Because I, I'll, I'll replay the two-hour episode well, we had with, with the uh, Army Ranger. But I, I mean, can't... we can go around and around saying present the evidence. If I say something specific, like I have a Bigfoot in my backyard and we've got pictures and all that stuff, saying present the evidence is legit. But for somebody saying, you know, the Mapanguari, you know, uh, what evidence, you know, you know, what, you know, what evidence is there for the existence of a Mapanguari? About the same as a Sasquatch. Say that. Grasshopper says Bigfoot is a marsu is marsupial. Runs. That's right. <laughs> well, who knows? You know, Australia's got some weird animals. They really do. Well, we had that discussion. Animals. Well, I think we're going to wrap the show up today. <laughs> On that note. Oh, man, I was having fun. The chat room is hopping. <laughs> don't get mad, Steve. Everybody's allowed their opinion. You know? But, you know, too, you know, don't shut anybody's opinion down, guys. You know, just, if you have a different theory, that's great. But we, we don't dismiss. We can talk, but we don't dismiss. Yeah, so my, my book's very, it's not very judgmental. And um, right. and people people often ask me, um, uh, they don't want to read anything where animals get hurt or die, right? That's like one of the things people say, I, I, I'm not going to buy your, I, I've sold a lot of them to clients, you know, through my practice. They're like, you just have to tell me nothing bad happens to the, to the creatures in it, you know, so, um, and, and obviously, you know, there's medical problems that happen to these creatures, but you know, in the end it all works, it, it works out. So sadly the jackalope died. No, the jackalopes did well. The I know. I'm just well. <laughs> They're resilient little creatures, you know, people, people, you know, rabbits, the, those wild rabbits, they know how to take care of themselves. It seems like every sporting goods store in New Mexico had a jackalope on the wall, though. Right. So that, I'm worried about the population. Um, they because, breed uh, well. They breed as well as the regular rabbit. So evidently, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about the jackalope population. Yeah, I, you know, I, as I said, I grew up in southern New Mexico, West Texas. Yeah, every every crummy little gift shop along the highway had a jackalope uh, skull or. You know, and it was, you know, clearly a taxidermied, um, you know, rabbit head with the smallest deer antlers they could find stuck on top. But yeah, it's good. You know, and jackalopes, um, but they persist. Um, they're not American. They actually go way back in European history. There's lots of uh, art artwork of French jackalopes and oh, that sort of thing. One of the, one of the things I really enjoyed about this book was, um, you know, when you write about mermaids, you know, there's such a long history of of mermaid literature and such a big part of our culture, you know, whether it's the little mermaid or splash or, right. you know, even going back to, um, 
you know, the, the Odyssey and um, um, Greek mythology. So, you know, I tried to weave a, a lot of that in. There's some fun things about, um, uh, I brought up fairies, but, you know, there's some great fairy stories out there. And, um, you know, the when, when my book is at the best, at its best, it almost reads like magical realism. I don't know how much into that you are, but, you know, just, uh, you know, we, when weird things, when weird things happen in a normal setting and you, you still believe that, you know, it really happened. So. Well, um, Dr. Tim, I haven't, you know, we, we spoke earlier and I haven't got a chance to, to get a copy of your book yet, which I'm right. going to correct that as soon as I can. But, uh, is there a section in there about sea monsters? I'm, I'm yeah, so so um, we have our own lake monster here in Western New York um, oh. that's been spotted, you know, all over Lake Erie. So yeah, there are some sea monsters. There are there is some sea monster rescue in this book. Um, yeah, so and you know, um, Lake Champlain has um, you know the the Champy. I think you, do you live pretty close to Champagne, Champlain, Steve? Uh, fairly close, yes. Yeah, you're on that. You're on the other end of the state. Yeah, so um, yeah, sea, mo sea monsters are fa are fascinating on on so many levels. Yeah, and it's pretty. It's a pretty big stretch to think that you know that plesiosaurs have lived for sixty five million years. You know, in the in the lakes in the lakes, but. Uh, yeah. Right. As far as identifying exactly what people are seeing would be difficult, but right. uh, it's kind of odd that so many people <clears throat> from so many different countries are spotting something unknown in the lake or in the lock, whatever. Right. Um, yeah. I, I went to I went to Barrie, Ontario, which is like right on the edge of um, the Algonquin Park, about about two and a half hours north of um buffalo for a reading mm -hmm. a few months ago and uh they have a, it's beautiful there uh and the lake simcoe is a really you know canada is known for its big lakes and i i go there to to read at the library and and meet some people and i find out you know as i start talking to them about cryptids they're like oh well we have our own sea monster that shows up a pair you know occasionally out in lake simcoe we call him blah 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 you know, like, wow. like, okay, let's go down and look for him. You know, well, that's see. cool. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're now everywhere. I'm, I'm now I'm going to show my age. Who is my favorite sea monster? Sigmund the sea monster. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that guy. That's the one, the guy with one tooth, right? That's right. Sigmund, remember? Sigmund. Sigmund's I remember that. It's back there, boy. It's hazy, but it's yeah. back there. Sigmund. That was a Marty Croft production mm. where you mm -hmm. do all those yeah. little. Um, yep. but, you, got couple, uh, you got a couple years on me. I'm not. I don't know that sea monster. Oh, that was oh. yeah. That's from gosh, uh, the early seventies, I think. Uh, yeah. Long, no, long time ago, Tim, Dr. I was Tim. I'm, I was born sixty seven. Maybe maybe I just missed out on that one. You may have. Yeah. You, may have. you should have been really close in there, but you know. Yeah. I'll go look uh, the, for them. The, it's hard to remember, you know, when you go back that far. What what did I watch Saturday mornings? Because that was it. That was the day. Uh, you know, now kids can turn the TV on uh, any day of the week, twenty four yeah. hours, <laughs> and they can watch a cartoon, whatever right. they want to watch. <clears throat> you know, in my day, and yeah. and most people born in the mid to late sixties, we had to wait for Saturday morning yeah. to watch yeah. cartoons. Yeah. Well, now they can just go to YouTube and watch you guys, whatever they want. Right? So, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm not complaining. You know, I, I feel like I'm a, a sponge sometimes. I just bounce from one topic to the other, and yeah, yeah. Wait, wait till you see the Bigfoot laugh track coming next. Okay. Yeah. Chris knows what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Just he I saw he it. saw the raw cut video and it's fell gonna over be it. good. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been making my own videos of cryptids around my world too. I saw um, that it, skiing and yeah, you saw the skier. Yeah, we follow each other on Instagram. Yeah, <coughs> most, playing most in people, the playing in the people, snow. Yeah, most people know Buffalo got buried in snow uh, right before Christmas. So um, I just put on my cross country skis and my son and I went out around in our in, me in a Bigfoot outfit and uh, yeah, got some good laughs out of people around the neighborhood. You know. 
the electric cool. boogaloo. That's the other one. The boogaloos. Uh, everybody's going. Everybody's uh, going down memory lane over in the chat yeah, now. Right, yeah. oh, you know, but it was a day. Grasshopper, yeah. HR puffing stuff. Yeah, you're old grasshopper. Yeah, <laughs> that didn't have any um uh, yeah. sublime uh, subliminal messages there, did it? HR puffing stuff. <laughs> Back in the day, there dude, used to I had. Children's programming on Saturday mornings yeah. and Sunday mornings, too. Well, you know, I always complained about having to get up in the mornings for school, for elementary school. I was like, you know, mom would come in there. Hey, come on, get up. You got to get ready for school. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, five more minutes, you know. And But on Saturday morning, I'm waking up at like 6 a.m. to go in there and turn on the TV so I can watch uh, The Land of the Lost or, or something, yeah. you know. Me too. Scooby Doo. Me too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, never, never had a complaint. You know, if I'm getting up to watch yeah. cartoons. Yeah. Where the raft goes down the prehistoric toilet. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love, like, oh man. Yeah. Goes down the prehistoric jet. Mm -hmm. I love this stuff. And that was good. <laughs> Uh, it was it was good family based television yeah. back then. It really was. It wasn't about uh, well, you know, you know, I don't well, know. It was. We just were too young to realize. Yeah, well, you know, we we got Three Stooges and the Bugs Bunny cartoons that were not politically correct and stuff, and we didn't think yeah. anything about it. Now, you know, if somebody saw one of those Bugs Bunny cartoons that's yeah. not politically correct, yeah. they would have a heart attack. I mean, you know, yeah, and make a big deal out of it to us as kids. Didn't think nothing about it. It was funny. Right. Yep. Nothing. So, so there's there have been like um Bugs Bunny film festivals of the stuff that they didn't put out because they were so racy. So if you if yeah. you have an interest in that, I'm sure it's somewhere on YouTube. If I find it, I will I will send it to you because they are I've seen some of them, they are hysterical. So yeah. so so what do you, what effect do you think having watching Land of the Lost did on your uh your uh, curiosity and your imagination, right? Because that's like, it's it's only a step away from what you guys spend a lot of your time doing. You know, it's like looking for looking for uh, unknown creatures, and you know, it's like um, I, I'm blanking on the is it Arthur Conan Doyle that wrote the book about um, H. G. Wells, where they go to the Lost World, right? You know, like like there's all these hidden all these hidden creatures out there that we just don't. They just didn't appreciate right. that they were there, right? Yeah. Oh, that would be cool. Uh, and, I, and I'll say, I'll say this to good old Raptor in there. We know who that is too. Um, yeah, you're welcome anytime, brother. Don't worry. I mean, uh, well, talk is talk, and and uh, it's just I, I think sometimes discourse happens because you can't necessarily get inflection or. Uh, I think inflection is probably the word I'm looking for on text. Yeah. And I think that's why things sometimes go wild. But, but usually I'll when a couple you, people have a discussion, it's a lot easier. So. Yeah. Why? Uh, the reason uh, I was getting up at 6 a.m. in the morning on Saturday to watch Land of the Lost was largely because I had a crush mm. on the girl Holly, uh, the little blonde girl. You know, and she was, I was, we were the same age, and I was like, oh my God. Well, actually, she was probably a little older than I was. Hmm. But oh and, my and, gosh. I just and and you probably watched Witch Mountain and raced to Witch Mountain because the same hmm. actress played Holly, played the note uh, as well. I, I don't know if it was the same one. Or, I don't think it's the same one. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know, Pretty Steve. Sure. Pretty sure. Anyway, <laughs> same shirt. <laughs> oh the slee stacks yeah donald you remember yeah yeah but they were so slow you know you just couldn't uh they couldn't catch you, you they just walked really slow so you, all you had to do is just run <laughs> oh okay. we gotta get out of here steve man we've yeah. done been down memory lane telling everybody how old we are and everything well folks uh another another show in the bag i want to thank 
Dr. Tim Otterson for coming on tonight. Check out his book. The in the buy in the description is a place you can grab the book, and uh, in the description below. So we again thank you, uh, Dr. Tim, and for all you do. Yeah, thank you. I, I, it's really great meeting you at that expo, the Chautauqua Lake Bigfoot Expo. Uh, really great, really great. I'm glad. I'm glad we could reconnect. Yep, and absolutely. I, I, I appreciate that you're you're enjoying the book. That that means that means a lot. Um, you know the feedback that I've gotten from from my veterinary colleagues and friends of mine who are writers, and then someone who actually studies this. Um, I mean that that really means a lot. Where can people acquire your book? Yeah, the standard places. I mean, it, it's it's actually was published in Toronto by Guernica Editions, um, so it's av available. You know, through all the conventional ways throughout Canada. And then they distribute <coughs> in the U.S. too. Um, so you know, people, you know, yeah, Amazon is you know the place where all the where all the books are. But it's also at Barnes and Noble, and you know, you can you you can find it just about anywhere. Um, like my local bookstore can order, you know, it's it's through Ingram Micro, which is a pr pretty big distributor. So you shouldn't have a hard time finding it. And if you're listening on the podcast, it's all yeah. creatures, weird and dangerous. Tim Otterson, DVM. Yep. Yep. Son, and, son, of, son of an otter. <laughs> and uh, for those on, uh, you know, our, our uh, Anchor FM channels, you know, uh, over there at, you know, uh, Spotify and iHeartRadio and every, everybody, uh, check it out. I'll leave a description for you guys and where to get the book in that, in that show description as well. So. Um, yeah, uh, if, if, before, if you haven't done it yet and you're on your way out, please hit the thumbs up or thumbs down. It doesn't matter. Um, it helps us with the algorithm. We appreciate it. Leave a comment later on. <laughs> and, um, I don't know what more to say today other than uh, the usual. Chris, you want to do your thing? Yeah. Well, again, I want to thank Dr. Tim for being on with us. It's been, it's been an honor to have you. I've really enjoyed having you. Um, I've got to get that book. <laughs> All oh. Creatures Weird and Dangerous. Dr. Right Tim Otterson, DVM. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll probably get mine off the uh, Amazon, Scamazon, whatever. Yeah. And <laughs> I want to thank all of our uh, uh, chat chat room listeners. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Everybody on uh, Anchor FM, Spotify, all the podcast listeners, we appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, if you've not been by the YouTube channel, you please check it out, Squatch D TV. Easy to find. Uh, check out some of the stuff on there. You can see the videos and, and you know, leave a like. Uh, if you hadn't subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button. If it's your first time listening, especially, so we you can receive the notifications, ring that bell. Uh, it helps us. It helps the search algorithm, and it helps helps people find us. So we just, you know, thank you so much. We appreciate you, each and every one. Okay, folks, as we can say, you can look forward to this week another Squatch Stories and uh, probably a couple of more laugh tracks and maybe something else. You never know. And uh, we'll be rolling out some other things real soon. Uh, only enhance the channel. Of course, everybody, I want everybody to have a great, happy, healthy week. God bless. And, of course, keep on squatching, folks. We'll catch you all next week here. Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, right here on Squatch DTV. Hey, folks, you've been watching Squatch DTV. Join us each week, Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, for the latest on the Bigfoot mystery. As always, we thank you for being our loyal viewers and encourage all to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Steve Culls. As always, have a great week. Stay safe. God bless. And keep on squatching.